there's so much going on uh, in the Middle East uh, right now, and that we could spend hours and hours uh, just going through so many different things going on in the, in the various countries, of course, all centered uh, in the land of Israel. But I wanted to just call to your attention briefly this morning. As you know, uh, I'll be heading over to the Middle East tomorrow. Uh, we'll be leading a group, some of whom are here with us uh, this morning. And uh, we're looking forward to a great time uh, of Bible study and fellowship and sightseeing uh, over in Israel. And hopefully while we're there, we can really bring a lot of these things together for those who will be attending. But I wanted to just share a few things with you in this Flashpoint Geo Prophecy Report uh, about uh, some of the issues that are taking place uh, over in the Middle East right now, particularly uh, in relation to Israel. First of all, there is an election coming up again. Uh, they have, um, uh, Israel has a very unusual and a very unique uh, system for uh, electing uh, its members of parliament and particularly the prime ministership. And so um, there are lots of parties. You know, we're typically a two-party nation. Occasionally we have an independent that will run. But in Israel, they have multiple parties um, that run. And you don't just get to be the, become the prime minister if you get the most votes. You have to form a coalition um, with opposing parties that you've been running against. And if you think it's tough uh, with two parties, imagine if you have multiple parties that are running and everybody who's voting for their particular party votes for that person or ideology uh, or stance that that party takes, obviously. And so uh, if you get the most votes, now you have to play nice with all of your opponents who trashed you during the campaign <laughs> and, um, and party members and all those kind of good things. So um, what is very interesting is that Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is back in the running once again for I believe his sixth, it would be his sixth term uh, if he is elected. He's doing very well in the polls over there, but he has people who have been with him in his Likud party before and have defected. And uh, so there's just a lot of dynamics. You know, he was under uh, indictment and uh, for bribery charges and for other things. And so you know what the world of politics is like because you live here in the United States and you can understand a lot of those things. They have a lot of the same things in their media uh, over there as well. So uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is in the running. There are also a variety of other parties that are to the center left. Um, that are running. Uh, Yesh Atid uh, is another one with the current prime minister that is uh, running for prime ministership there as well. He was in a shared, a shared prime ministership with another individual, and now he has taken over, but he hasn't been prime minister for very long, so he hasn't really developed a track record um, other than uh, what people have seen in the last several months since he's taken over the prime ministership. So we'll have to see what happens with that. There are a lot of ultra-religious parties um, that are running uh, within Israel as well, ultra-Orthodox parties and, and uh, Orthodox, uh, not ultra-Orthodox, but Orthodox parties as well that are running. So it is a very interesting dynamic. But what you should understand is there is a rising individual uh, that is uh, trying to become prime minister and have his party rule, which is a religious Zionist party that is kind of uh, gaining traction from everything that they're seeing in the polling uh, over there as well. So it will be interesting to see if Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wins, uh, how he will form a coalition. And that's always a question because if you have to uh, form this coalition with parties who are diametrically opposed to what your position or platform is, it makes for a very difficult uh, ruling when you get into power. So will the country move more to its religious roots? Um, will it uh, impose more religious laws? Or will it move more secular? And you have this, this dichotomy this, that are, people are diametrically opposed within the land of Israel. It's like between a rock and hard place and no one is giving in. But it seems as though the nation is tending to move more in the area of religious Judaism and the things related to that. And that becomes very significant potentially 
uh, as we're looking at the Bible and biblical prophecy because we believe that there will be a reinstituted animal sacrificial system in Jerusalem prior to the rise of the Antichrist who will sign a covenant or confirm a covenant with Israel and then at the midpoint of that final seven years uh, he will break that covenant and the Bible says and cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease or to stop within Israel, which means there is some type of a rebuilt structure, whether it's a tabernacle structure, a tent structure, or a grandiose temple, we do not know, but there will be some type of reinstituted animal sacrificial system, and there are those in Israel that are preparing and have been preparing for that moment when Israel can go back up onto the Temple Mount and reinstitute those animal sacrifices. So uh, be watching because as you see the dynamic shifting, it can have a great impact on the future and what the Bible has to say about Israel in the last days. Now, I wanna also bring it your attention something else that is going on, and that is the war with Russia and Ukraine and Israel's connection to it. Um, you know in recent days, Russia has been um, assaulting uh, Kiev, uh, which is uh, the capital city in Ukraine, and you have Russian missiles that have been coming in, doing a lot of damage, and the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, has said to Israel, we need your Iron Dome missile defense system. We need it here installed, and he's been putting a lot of pressure on Israel to provide its Iron Dome missile defense system, which Israel is famous for, um, to protect Kiev from the incoming Russian missiles. And Israel has said no. And there are reasons why Israel has said no, and I'm gonna share a couple of those with you. Um, first of all, Ukraine through recent history um, has not been a fan of Israel. As a matter of fact, in recent days, there have been 122 anti-Israel resolutions in the United Nations of which 90, let me get this right, 95 of them Ukraine voted for. So, so of the 122 anti-Israel resolutions in the United Nations, n Ukraine voted for 95 of them, and the rest of them, they abstained from voting. So Israel, uh, Ukraine has not been a friend to Israel through the years. So that's number one. Number two is that Israel uh, the, the Iron Dome missile defense system is primarily designed, from what I understand, to deal with uh, uh, incoming rockets that are not necessarily precision-guided missiles the way Russia would be firing into Ukraine. And so the Iron Dome is not specifically uh, geared towards dealing with precision-guided missiles that would be coming in or being fired from Russia. That's the second. Uh, the third is Israel is concerned that its Iron Dome missile defense system, which has amazing technology, could potentially fall into the hands of rogue uh, nations or rogue entities, and they also are concerned that it could fall into the hands of Russia. So uh, Israel is very concerned about giving its iron defense missile system there uh, for Ukraine to use. And I'll give you another one, and that is that Israel has a very delicate balance that it must walk in relation to what is going on in Syria to the north of Israel on Israel's northern border. Remember that Syria is very weak after the war that had taken place there, and Iran has moved into Syria in large measure. Even, even though Syria is still in existence, it's really a puppet nation of Iran in large measure. And Russia also has a significant presence in Syria and its military. So Israel and Russia have this, this um, uneasy agreement and by which Israel says, look, we will respect your Russian influence in Syria if you don't allow the Iranians to continue pouring weapon systems into Syria just to the north of our border. And Russia has kind of looked the other way as Israel has gone in to decimate some of these Iranian beachheads that they've been trying to set up just to the north of Israel's border, taking out missile systems and other military uh, assets that Iran has moved into Syria. So Russia is also there, and Russia has looked the other way 
when Israel has come in to, to try to take care of these Iranian military assets that have been set up just to the north of their border. So Israel doesn't want to do anything overtly to anger Russia because of what's going on in Syria, north of Israel. So there's this very, very delicate uh, balance of things that are taking place. And then one final third thing that I want to raise uh, to your attention, and that is that there is a battle going on in the Eastern Mediterranean as it relates to natural gas. And that's a big discussion for another day, except to say that there is a lot of, um, a lot of players sticking their hands into the cookie jar uh, some who don't legally belong there and others who are major players in what's going on in the natural gas battle in the Eastern Mediterranean. All of this is related to Europe needing natural gas energy as they're moving into winter time and the two Russian pipelines of Nord Stream 1 and 2 that run through the Baltic from Russia to Germany are now out of commission because of sabotage that took place there. Well, Israel is sitting on large natural gas deposits, and Europe has done a deal with Israel and Egypt to move Israel's natural gas reserves by an existing pipeline that, will run, that runs to Egypt, and Egypt has a, a liquid um, natural gas plant. So in other words, it takes natural gas and liquefies it, and will put it on tankers and move it to Europe so that Europe will be receiving Israeli natural gas via Egypt over in the European continent for this winter, which will help in some measure to offset the loss of Russian natural gas that would have been coming in through the Nord Stream pipeline in the Baltic Sea. Added to this, Israel and its northern neighbor Lebanon, also on the Mediterranean coast, have been at odds over discoveries of natural gas off of their coast where Israel says this is clearly, this discovery is clearly within our economic zone by international standards. And Lebanon says, no, 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 that's, that belongs to us. And so there has been this uh, major tension between Israel and Lebanon over these dis newly discovered natural gas deposits. And the United Nations, but primarily the United States, um, and other international agencies have been trying to get them to work out the details. The rogue terrorist elements that are within Lebanon had said, leading up to what just took place, that uh, if Israel claims these natural gas pipelines or these natural gas uh, reserves, deposits off of our coast, we will terrorize them. We will terrorize the, the, um, the platforms um, that are there. So kind of pushing away the agencies that are doing the work out in the water. Um, Israel and Lebanon just reached an agreement, a historic agreement to share, if you will, those natural gas deposits off of their coast. This is a historic agreement, very significant, and in, if it holds, it will pave the way for a whole realignment of what is taking place in the Eastern Mediterranean as it relates to natural gas and its delivery to Europe. All of these things, you can see how they interplay together, and I believe all of them are moving us ever closer to the rising of the Antichrist, that one who will come against and in place of the true Christ. Uh, Israel will sign a covenant or confirm a covenant with that individual. And I believe that these things are moving us towards putting in motion the events of the last days. So it's important that God's people are aware of some of these developments and are watching and have discernment. Um, as we see these things arise. So that's what I have for you today. I hope it's helpful for you just to kind of maybe whet your appetite to do a little bit more uh, exploration on your own, doing a little bit more research and keeping an eye on what is taking place in the Middle East.